everybody, here we are again, my workshop, Colwyn Way, um, and we are bringing the skill centre to your home. Um, second part of today, today um, on a very, very hot um, Thursday in the southwest of the UK. Um, the two part of it, if you watched on Tuesday, um, we were making or looking at making this three piece uh, raised bowl, um, and we made the base, okay, nice. 6 inch 150mm base and we've got the stem here uh, ready to do so we roughed down we've done the tenons so there's a couple of things I wanted to go over just before we start we've got Charlie behind the camera this time um, Finn's down the beach and uh, and Charlie's behind the camera so uh, if Charlie knows what he's doing ask him the questions he'll then convey those questions to me now before I start go on uh, here's a question that wasn't answered last week. Yes. Um, why did you use a screen chuck rather than, say, a rig plate for f jaws that, that from, would have been more secure? Was that from David? Yes. David, I've got your name on this piece of wood here. David Martin, why screw chuck? Because me and Finn looked through the video last week and throughout we could see your questions and Charlie and Finley were saying to me, Dad, I didn't see that question, I didn't see that question. So I said, right, that's okay, we'll write it down. So there's your name there, David Martin, Y Screw Chuck. So we didn't forget you. The reason being, David, um, we use absolutely, um, face plates would be far more secure, and in fact, for the bowl, we're using a face plate. Okay? Um, so that was the reason there. But, however, if you think about what we've done on this one, if we use the face plate here, the screw holes would be in this bit. So I use a screw chuck, which, knowing that we're going to make um, a mortise in here. So screw chuck there, then we're able to turn at the hold point and then we can take away all signs of that screw hole of that screw chuck. Do you see what I mean though? If we had screws, they would just be in the wrong place. So that, that was the only reason. Um, and apologies again for missing your, um, your question uh, on Tuesday. Um, but the other piece in a minute, the raised bolt, we're back to um, face plates. So I don't have to ask that question, ask that question anymore. Um, and one other question that I wanted to get to um, Somebody else was asking about why are we doing um, end grain for beginners. The, re the reason being that end grain is tackled by somebody that's just picked up a label for the first time, um, whether they're an intermediate turner, whether they're a professional turner. So whether you've been turning for a long time, whether you've just started, you've got to tackle end grain. It's not any more difficult than side grain, you just need to know how to do it. I'm just guessing the person that asked the question may not have been into turning that much. But there, let's uh, let's have a look. I'm going to turn the light on. Dim it down a little bit. If you can hear a funny noise, everybody, we've got um, a nice big fan blasting both myself and Charlie to keep us cool because it's, it's quite a hot workshop today. So, right, without further ado, let's crack on. Tenons are done. So all we've got to do now is make a nice shape. Um, someone was saying on the feed, um, interested in to see what design we're going to come up with. I'm going to be honest with you, I have not got, I've got a rough idea of what I'm going to do, but the design will, will appear. If, if you're unsure about design, sketch it out first, that's the best way to do it. Um, I've got a rough idea, it's going to be an old lamp design that I'm, I've used a fair bit. Right, so I'm just going to measure. At the moment, that's too wide a diameter to sit in there, so I'm going to measure the width. Obviously, the, all this measurement becomes far more important if you're making a matching pair of something. This, I'm going to give myself a break. This isn't going to be a matching pair at all. So, um, I'm going to stick with that. So, we've got quite a lot to take off. That's the top, because if you remember, again on Tuesday, we discussed the fact that this tenon this side is going to be a little bit shorter to go into the fruit bowl. Okay. So let's have a look. So I need to take about 10 mil off of there. There's no need doing it with, with anything by a rough and gouge, that's its job. The rough and gouge's job is to literally take square to round or diameter down. So we're gonna start with the rough and gouge. Are we all good there, Charlie, with the angles and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, is the Tormek tool setter the same setting on an eight inch stone as on a 10 inch? Yes. And can... Uh, never mind. 
Yeah. Yeah. The um, the Tormek tool setter, the TTS 100, absolutely. So I use on my um, Tormek jig um, position four, and then I use a 65 mil protrusion on there. Um, and then yes, we're going to use hole A um, to achieve that. So whether it's a, a four, a six, an eight, a ten, a twelve inch stone, regardless of what sizes, it's going to be the same thing um, to do. Same 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 setup. So very quickly, this is a rough end, and I'm not going to waste too much time on this. Well, not waste time, sorry, rather, um, I just want to get this done so we can crack on to the bowl. So there's my diameter, let's carry on with the roughing gouge. Now I'm going to raise the tool rest and just skew chisel back clean. And I'm going to put a flat section in here. This is going to be what we call a fillet. So let's go um, just, just to divide the fillet, which is this bit, away from everything else. Let's go to a spindle or a bowl gouge. In fact, I'll go to a bowl gouge because I'm going to take a fairly deep cut from there. So a six mil bowl gouge. I'm going to have a nice fat belly there and we're going to taper down a nice sort of voluptuous curve. using the um, bowl gouge to give some nice deep concaves and the cones and the convex curves. The only difference when you're doing these is we're going to move the handle in a different direction, that's all. So let's do one more finishing cut on this curve here. Go in with my skew. I just want to create a little bit of definition there, so nice and deep. Now let's tidy those edges up. So let's go in another skew. I'm just gonna, oh, clipped an edge there. Just a little, a little feature on the end. I think I can sound that. I clipped the edge as I went into that area, just on the, the side here. That will sound out. We'll get away with that. Um, right. So nice and curvaceous here. I'm going to take this down a little bit, not too much. Just a little skew cut. There we are. That should be fine. Uh, what do we need to do now? So we're nice and deep. I'm going to do the same thing up here. Have a little fillet. And we're going nice and deep. to notice now how we're starting this cut off. I'm always starting with the bevel rubbing and just pushing the handle away from me to pivot in the cutting edge, letting that bevel then slide along the surface of the timber. So what you, you'll get then is a nice burnished finish. If you drag the chisel tip around you're not getting that nice clean finish. 
um, which is obviously it's really important. It's going to help us hugely in, in um, sanding in a moment. Um, when you sharpen your signature skew, do yes. you use a belt sander or a CBN wheel? So, um, most of my sharpening, in fact, 99% of it gets done either on the tool mech or on a CBN wheel, sometimes on an aluminium oxide wheel. Um, I'm, I rarely use the linishing type um, uh, uh, sharpening system, I'm completely honest. Sometimes I have to, because people want to see how they work. But my preference is wheels all the time, whether it's wet or dry. Um, you know, for me, that's what I've been brought up with. In fact, I've been brought up when I first started. It was aluminium um, carborundum all the time, um, but now we've obviously developed CBN and things like that. So it's been ten minutes. It's been ten minutes. Okay, we're going to sand that up. Give it a bit of an oil. Spend time, just spend time on it, don't rush, no need. Is your spindle lock pin magnetic or hanging on a magnet? Um, at mine, at the moment, is a non-magnetic non one, um, but nowadays they come with a little magnet on the end. This is one of the very early versions, um, so like I said, a little magnet is now attached to the end. So mine is on my lathe on a little um, rare earth magnet, but you won't need that if you're buying one now. And um, grit numbers aside, would you be able to give them a very quick tour of the different types of abrasive, e.g. J-Flex, Miralon pads, Abernat? Um, yes, yes, yes. I mean, if you're looking at very quickly. a good quality um, abrasive, then you're, you're going to be fine. I tend to, on the lathe, I tend to prefer material back to braises. Um, I just find that they last a lot longer, they're more flexible. Um, if you're buying really cheap paper abrasive, then the paper will break down before the, the grit runs out. So you're, you're, you know, the grit is still cutting, but uh, most of the time it would have fallen off and, and dropped to the floor. So I would always spend a bit of time on a, a bit of money on abrasive. This is the J Flex, um, and it, it's, I'll be honest, it's not cheap. But nor would be the um, Abronet, uh, the Merca, all those sorts of things, and they're all equally as good. So when we're talking Merca or Abronet, so there's the Abronet stuff. So th you'll know Abronet because it's got the, the you know the holes in it, and um, this is good for um, keeping the, the material cool. So if you've got something that you need to keep all exotic spring to mind, or very waxy timbers, they're those sorts of materials. Um, they're going to cause you problems with clogging up or overheating, that sort of thing. So that's when I'd use those. But any good quality um, abrasive out there. Um, 
I always say that I'm in my Axminster bubble, so I, I use what, as a company, we sell. Um, and it, it, uh, you know, it works for me. But not only that, um, not only do I use what we sell, but I have a, a good say in, in you know, turning products and what comes in. So we, we do make sure that it works, um, and I'll only use, you know that because you see what I use, and uh, I will only use what, um, what I feel works and is right for us. Now that's, I let that dry that oil a little bit, that was from Tuesday and it's been really, really hot in the workshop so it's a little bit gunky. It doesn't matter, that's the beauty of oil. Um, I'm just going to wipe off a bit of the excesses and a little bit of the, the dry, the scum from the top. So down to just low speed and a very light sand with a 600 grit and I'm going to just blitz through it. Which oil is that? That is the same as we used, um, or well reminded actually, that was the same as we used on Tuesday, which was the, um, the chestnut finishing oil. But if you remember, we also said that we're gonna do a different oil on the bowl. So we're gonna use food safe oil on the bowl. Um, the difference between the two, food safe oil is um, great for wet foods. Um, it's an inert uh, mineral oil um, where a um, finishing oil generally you need to check the packaging of course but generally it's what we call toy safe so it's only safe to mouth once fully dry there we are I say safe to mouth don't take my word for it read the packaging follow all the guidelines there we are so that's our stem so Charlie just pan back a minute that stem will need to dry properly and we'll need to give it another burnish and another buff. But that, hopefully, if, you know, as long as nothing's moved over those few days, there we are. So there, we got our nice stable base, a nice dumpy base. We're gonna make our bowl now to fit on there. So we're gonna sit on there nicely. I might take, I might take a little bit of the diameter away. We'll have a look in a moment. So I'm gonna pop that to one side before I knock it off. Charlie, don't let me forget, we're going to use the food safe oil on the bowl. I'm going to whiz through the bowl. I think I said on them Tuesday that I purposely haven't done that much, much bowl turning with you. Um, only because everybody turns bowls, and you've probably seen people turn bowls a lot. So I purposely didn't do too much of that. But it's, of getting away from this, we have no choice. Um, we might even get some bigger tools out. Put our centers away. So to start with, I'm going to skim the outside edge. The question was asked again on Tuesday, why didn't I do that first? Well, if it was unbalanced, I would have done that first, but that small piece on Tuesday wasn't that unbalanced, so it didn't matter too much. Lay speed now has to go down to zero. I need to be very careful. Um, make sure nothing's touching the tool rest. So my first job, I'm going to work on all of the hole points. So we're going to do a tenon. Um, so to start with, I'm going to get a rough shape. So skim the outside edge, skim the surface. Do the hole for the um, for the tenon, um, and then do a little hole point. Now I'm going to use seed jaws on this one. That will then have to be reversed afterwards. So I'm not going to hang around. I'm going to crack on. We've got a lot to do. So let's go. Um, I'll go with a nice three eight gauge first. Um, what's the difference between finishing oil and Danish oil? Danish oil, is, is, um, Danish oil, depending on the brand that you get, will have a very similar. Um, a very similar makeup to finishing oil. Back in the day, um, Danish oil was an outdoor oil, and now the, bl the blend is a little bit um, finer. Um, and I've had some really, really good results recently, actually, with the Danish oil. If you go on accidents, you 
you go on Axminster's Instagram um, account and you'll see some stills there, there's a picture of water droplets on a table and that was finished and that was Danishaw that we used for that. Just double check, double check the packaging. If it's for anything that likely that, that, that's going to be put in the mouth or anything like that, Toy Safe needs to be on the tin. Um, salad bowls, things like that, I'd always go food safe, you know, better safe than sorry. Um, so just double check. Can you use a worm screw to mount a bowl blank if you haven't got a spindle lock? have to read that one out to me again mate. Can you use a worm screw to mount a bowl blank if you haven't got a spindle lock? If you haven't got a spindle lock. Do you mean, I think you mean, a, is it a screw chuck that you're talking about, the worm screw? Um, if, it's a, if it's a screw chuck then absolutely you can, yes. If not, just add a little bit more to your question if not. Just skim the surface, that's all. Just make sure we've got, what we're dealing with there is flat, well not flat, but not undulating anymore. Um, so now we're gonna add the uh, recess. It's been 20 minutes. 20 minutes, thank you. Um, have you ever had a rag slash paper towel used for finishing spontaneously combust? No, I haven't. Um, but I have heard of it happening. Um, the best story that I can tell you there um, was from a couple of sub submariners who came um, and done a course, husband and wife, and they've been in the Navy all their life, and they're one of the biggest fear is, uh, is spontaneous combustion uh, with oily rags. They have bins all over the, the submarine where you put the, um, put the rags to stop that sort of thing from happening. I've heard some, some stories of it happening, yes. Um, you know, it's, it's basic chemistry, isn't it? You know, you know what um, a heap of horse manure does if it's left long enough. You can see the steam and the and smoke coming away from it. It's the same sort of thing. So a big bundle of rags together it will, you know, will sometimes cause a problem. So don't do it. Leave them out the dry. Don't bundle them together. I'm just going to uh, make a a shallow hole just to the depth of the drill bit always when you retract just made Charlie jump out of his skin always on the retraction what that noise is is friction it's dry timber but it's just very um, it's vibrating in that hole massively fast so um, it's got to be careful that's a horrible noise Right, so I'm ga now going to um, make, sorry, turning my back on you. Now I'm going to make the um, diameter for the external grip on the jaw. There's my C jaw uh, measurement there, using the speed sizer. And all I'm going to do is just make a little dug tub. That will be taken away later, so don't don't panic. Don't think, oh, that's going to show. It won't. So we have a little flat. So actually, I made the wrong measurement. Ah, ah. I've measured the external. I want to measure the internal. We're going to contract. So C. I was just looking at that and thinking, that's big. Where I need to be. And I'm going three mil. Now I'm going to um, just pull that waste cinder away. So 
what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn the extractor on guys, this is a horrible loud process anyway, so I can imagine it's only coming through the camera the same, so turn your volume down for a bit, any questions that you ask during the time of me doing this, we'll answer afterwards, um, but I just want to get this, this noisy bit out of the way. So let's have the extractor on, it's a, it's a dry bit of timber, it's a bit dusty, I don't want myself or, I don't want myself or Charlie breathing in too much of the dust, if any. And, and we'll work on a shape, so we're going to have a nice flat platform. landing for um, our um, stem to mount onto. Don't worry, that whole point is going to be taken away afterwards. Taking this way, the landing um, will disappear. So we're going to sand that up next. Lay speed down a little bit so I don't get too much dust flying everywhere. We're going to use a variation of um, sanding technique. So we're going to start with some hand sanding, I'm going to go into some rotary sanding as well. You could of course power sand, absolutely no issue. Nice and quick, just watch the temperature. Even these lovely um, ashes and beech and oak and things like that, they'll crack if you get too hot. So we'll get the work on with the 100 grit, then we'll go to a rotary fan. Been half an hour. Been half an hour. Okay, we're we're going away. A 120 grit here now. So we're just taking off those 
scratch is made by the 100 grit. Um, which is better, hand or rotary, and why? Um, I don't think one's better than the other. The reason that I'm using both of them is you think about when I'm sanding with this one, I'm making scratches that way. When I'm sanding with this one, I'm making scratches that way. And they crisscross each other, so they cancel each other out. You're not left then with any major scratches in one direction. So when you finish, you're not going to see those telltale signs of a scratch. So that's, that's why I use both together, and it works really well. So now I've got a 180 on the rotary, and I've got uh, a 150 hand. So each time you're cancelling out the previous separation. And I'm belting through this much quicker than you need to. Like I say, take your time, enjoy the process, enjoy the project. So 240 grit on my rotary. And we're going to a 240 on the hand sanding as well. So we just left with rotary, so now back to hand. Then we're going to go that one. Could you also also sand, it, sand in reverse on alternate grits to remove those lines? Yeah, no, absolutely. If you're really struggling with a piece, say a bit of sycamore or um, walnut, which really cause problems, or an, even an exotic, then yeah, put it in reverse. Don't forget, do your grub screws up, make sure nothing's going to fly off the lay that you But yeah, absolutely. Someone is doing theirs in sycamore. Yep. Do you think a spirit dye would work nicely or should they just leave it natural? Depends on what your view is. If you like color, spirit dye would be great. Um, think about when you use a spirit dye, especially on a bowl blank, think about your sanding. You must be absolutely on point with your sanding because this dye will pick up the slightest little scratch. And um, why don't you have the extractor on the side, the chips and dust are flying off? Um, the dust extractor, any extractor you have, will not pick up chips and dust. Oh, sorry, chips um, and shavings like that, unless they're heading in that direction. The dust extractor's job is to take the dust out of the air. The reason being that the velocity and the, the weight of a chip or a, um, a shaving is just too great. And if you had a dust extractor that could do that, it will be ripping tools out of your hands as well. Um, so the shavings aren't a problem, it's not something that I can breathe in, but the dust is the issue. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why. There we are, that's a bit of a sand with our 600 grit, now we'll burnish. Remember that little lip there is going to disappear in a minute. We're just using it to hold on to the bowl to start with. You could, of course, use a recess and use a recess then as the um, as the tenon if you wanted to, if your stem was big enough. There we are. That'll do. So we'll give that another little buff in a minute when we um, when we finish the inside. But for the moment, that's the outside of that bowl done. A little flat there for the tenon to butt up onto. Right, 
out my pin. So we've got to put our seed jaws on. So the 114. Now we're going to grip. So the gripping section on the inside of a seed jaw is not a dovetail, it's a tooth. It's that little tooth. So that's the reason I was just preempting some, some questions there. Why such a small lip? It's because I don't need anything bigger. It's only a small tooth on there. I'm absolutely aware that there's a hole running through the middle, so I'm not gonna give it a huge amount of welling. I'm gonna also be cautious of that when I'm taking the inside out. I'm gonna do the same thing, nurse it a little bit. one side just for the moment we'll get that spinning again we'll start at zero on my lane speed slowly bring that speed up there we are and I'm just going to very quickly give my gouge a bit of a sharpen Charlie do you want to just come around to the sharpener let everybody see the sharpening system a minute don't forget we're connected um, I'm going to have to come over this side, so if you go over there a little bit. So there's my old slow speed sharpening system. I'm going to set up with the Tormek grind, so protrusion through my bowl gouge jig of 65 mil. To achieve that, I'm using the TTS 100. That uh, is 65 mil there, so I'm going to look, push that through, and then we were talking earlier about the settings for a different size wheel. So we use hole A, go over the bar, and make sure both of those both of those metal discs touch the wheel. That gives me the right distance each time. 65mm protrusion and position 4 on the jig. Now I'm going to try and get my body out of the way so you can see what's happening here. And then all we do, this is CBM wheel, so a really nice cutting wheel. That's going to come up, and then we just gently rotate around. Just takes all the guesswork out of it. Now I'm going to try, I'm going to tell, Charlie's going to tell me if the camera can um, focus on this. Coming close is not always the key um, on these cameras. Is that focusing at all? Yeah. So you can see hopefully that that's a, a really clean sharpen on there. And like I said to you on Tuesday, the CBN for me, one of the, probably the closest thing that you can get to sharpening on um, a very fine wheel like a Tormet. Um, but you know, it has the speed to be able to sharpen regularly. So there's a very quick sharpen. Okay, back to the bowl, Charles. It's been 40 minutes. 40 minutes, right, we're gonna whip this one. I might not even sat bother sanding it for you, but we'll put it together so you can see. Um, right, lay speed to zero. I'm gonna start by cleaning up the outside edge. I'm also aware that I've now got in the bottom of this bowl, a recess, which I've got to be careful of. Don't want to go through that. Charlie, would you turn the fan off? I'm getting shavings in my face. Here I'm doing a push cut. The reason I'm going to do a push cut is because I don't want to drag the cut this up this way because you get a lot of um, breakout if you do that. So just a push cut on this edge. And you can round that over, you can do whatever you want on there really. We're going to do the same thing here. I'm going to have the dust extractor go in, just to take some of the dust out of the air. Um, and we're going to keep an eye on your questions.
think about this guys, if you're doing these cuts, you don't need to go to the bottom of the cut each time, because if you do that, the likelihood is you're going to go through the bottom of the bowl. What I'm doing is um, losing some of the waste material and start getting the thickness from my outside edge. I need to leave strength in the middle. having problems with the tool grabbing as you go in to start with, pause and in that pause you're creating a little lip for the bevel to rub against. If you're really struggling on your last cut, turn the flute all the way over to um, 3 o'clock, then present and you then turn back. shallow um, tear here. I personally would just go and rip that out. However, if 
something that's bugging you, what you can do, a little bit of care and practice on this bit, is do a little shear scrape. A scraper with a, a negative rate, so this one hasn't, but put another um, another bevel on the top. You can get some really nice skewing actions coming across there. You can see how those tears are disappearing because we're coming against the grain in, in the direction it wants to be cut. I got a few questions when you're ready. Okay, let's just turn that off and answer some of these questions a moment. Um, so, how are you hanging your chuck jaws on the workshop wall? Turn around, Charles. So, um, jaw hangers, what they're called. Thanks, Mr. Tools. Go on to the website, get a look for um, jaw hangers. Um, do them in two lengths, do them um, in uh, 300 or the 600, so you can use um, hang four or um, eight jaws at a time. Really useful those. Um, jaw hangers and you've seen me take the chucks off the wall so many times. Little chuck hubs and you just buy the, the thread size to suit your lathe. Alright, so chuck hubs, jaw hangers, get everything up off, off the um, bench top. Um, is there a reason why you use Tormek settings or person's preference. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna turn that off. Um, <coughs> the reason that I use Tormek settings is because it's repeatable, um, and because I'm teaching normal life, whatever that was. Um, I'm teaching on a daily basis, and I need to send someone away with a. Um, a recognized grind and the Tormit ones work you know is I don't think I could improve it in any way that I tend to use uh, position number four on the Tormit guide whether I'm using Tormit whether I'm using CBN um, any stone it's the same sort of thing it's a repeatable um, recipe I suppose and an easy one to understand um, is it normal for the slow running running grinder with CBM will to vibrate a little bit. Uh, it shouldn't be. No, no, it shouldn't be. Um, I've never no. Well, I certainly never had one that's vibrated. But no, it shouldn't shouldn't vibrate. Just check the machine before and after, and it should you know it should still be the same. How thin can you go on the bowl before you start to worry about its strength? Probably about. Oh, here, oh, on the wall thickness, wow. Um, this is a very dry piece of timber that's um, vibrating an awful lot. So I wouldn't want to go too much thinner while someone's watching, is the honest answer. Um, because the, that, that vibration is going to take me a long time to sand it up. Um, if it was wet timber, it doesn't matter, I could go down to a couple of mil. Um, in fact, I've seen turners go down even thinner than that, especially if you're piercing. Um, it depends on the material that you're turning at the time, how dry it is or isn't, um, tools you're using, all those sorts of things, and the di the size of it, of course, the diameter. Um, how long have we had, Charlie? 50 minutes. We're 50 minutes, right. So we're not going to sand this, guys. I'll get it finished for you when you um, when you come back and see me for Tuesday. Go on, you got another question? Uh, what did you mount your grinder to? Grinder's on a baseboard. Look, right, let's come back to that. Just pan around to the... Um, Grinder again. So um, we've got this on a just a baseboard. I'd recommend doing that even if you're not using jigs to be honest because you can clamp it down, you don't have to screw anything down, you don't have to screw this through. Um, gets a couple of clamps on there if you want to. This comes out fairly regularly or used to come out fairly regularly for demonstrations. Um, and it does mean that you can put different mounts on it as well if you want. You can see at the moment I'm really close up here. This is for the, um, for sharpening um, some scrapers uh, not long ago. Um, but yeah, this is a piece of MDF. It's a melamine-faced MDF. 
um, medium density fiberboard and it works it works well a bit of plywood do the same um, I probably wouldn't use a bit of timber because you, you can't rely on that stain um, stain flat but uh, yeah man-made uh, materials work well on that and do you use Tormek jig using your CBM wheel? Uh, do I use Tormek? Yes, Tormek jigs on the CBN. Yes, sorry, I, I it took me a while to get what you were saying there. Right now, very very quickly, I'm going to remove that foot. I forgot about that, so we're going to do that. So luckily, we're not sanding. Um, let's use push plate. I can all, I can ream out that and sand that. Again, I have no problem doing that. Push plate, how many times have we spoken push plates in this series? Push plate's a piece of plywood with a bit of bit of router matting. You've got seven minutes. Not a problem, not a problem. It won't take long this bit. Lay speed to zero all the time. Tail stock is needed. Beauty here is because we've used force a bit to drill. I've got a really nice center point there so we can locate that on our on our center and this is going to be so much easier than regular reversing of bowls as well so we'll use this lathe center in there. I've already aligned the lathe so I know that it, it's um it's all lined up. Wind the centre onto the centre point of the bowl there. Just loosely tighten it, give it a rotate rotation, and then make sure everything's nice and tight. Tight but not too tight. We can still go through the bottom of the bowl, of course, so you don't want that to happen. And then I'll just remove that last little bit and we put it all together. Um, I'm going to use a little quarter inch gouge, bowl gouge. What did you use to stick the root? router mat on the friction plate. A bit of um, contact adhesive. Yeah, a bit of contact adhesive. You know the type, put a bit on both sides, let it dry for a little bit and then, and then away you go. So now we've done that, I suspect we're gonna have to take a little bit off of our Too bad, actually. I will remove a little bit um, for you. For... How do you align your lathe? Lathe alignment. Let's take that bit off. Much to Charlie's um, frustration, we're, I'm just going to talk to you about lathe alignment and why we do it. Got five minutes. Got five minutes. Yeah, we've got plenty. Plenty of time for that. So let's just have a look. So there, there's our bowl. It obviously needs to be glued together. I'm a fan of tight bond, um, so I would probably use tight bond two on that. A nice, nice glue for us woodies. Um, I think it's fairly well balanced, that one. There's a good mixture. I didn't want to be too big on that bowl on the top, otherwise it's going to make this one look too small. And I'm quite pleased with the stem. And that's an ash. Um, a bowl that one. Obviously I'm going to need to do the sanding and the finishing in here and I'll use the uh, food safe oil on that one um, just to show you a difference if, if there is a difference in colour or finish. Um, I do know that's completely colourless like I say um, on that one. So let's just move that to one side. Um, lathe centering. I'll bring this back out in a minute. So lathe centering and never think of Never think of um, at any centre I'm putting in the head, so it's just that one because it's got a point on it that I'm using. Um, never think of shimming, the filing or anything like that. There's so many reasons the lathe won't be centred. Main reason is you've got a swivelling headstock. A swivelling headstock has to lock in each time, so if it locks in, 
so accurately, you're going to struggle. You want to take a bit of dust or shaving, so there's always, always a little bit of play on there. So what I'll do is literally, there's the locking lever. There's that little bit of, well, two mil play. So we're going to bring this up, and we're going to, it's called a kiss test. And basically, you're aligning the two points, and you're moving just, just by hand. There we go. Um, we're aligning that up and as long as those two points meet exactly that's where we're up we're happy if you can't do that there is probably a very very good reason it may be that your floor isn't level mine certainly isn't most slaves now come with risers not just feet they're actually um, threaded and they're designed to take the spring out of the bed if the, the bed's uh, floor's not level the bed will warp it will do that it will always sit down um, true on the floor um, because the floor, uh, the, the, the lathe is so heavy, it will naturally do that. So you need to use those adjusters to bring that bed line. Back in the day, they used to use a, a pair of uh, things called winding sticks, which, which you'd eyeball up down the length of the bed. Um, now we use the kiss test and those risers to, to sort that out. Um, but that, that's the easiest way. You can get a centering um, uh, device as well. Two more to taper either side, you put them in both sides and then lock everything up. These come with it now, I believe, and so do the 2030s. Um, well, the bigger lathe, the, the metric equivalent of the, the bigger lathe to this one. Um, but that's the easiest way. Kiss test is quick, um, takes literally two to three seconds to do, um, and, you're, and you're away. You've got a nice level ready for drilling um, lathe, because that's the only time you need it. If you're turning normally between centres, it doesn't have to be bang on. Um, but there we are. You've got a project now. Hopefully we can see some pictures of these come flying in. Um, <coughs> I'll get this one sanded up and polished ready for you uh, for Tuesday. Um, keep looking at the, the, um, the, the Facebook page um, and Instagram as to see what next week's subjects are going to be. But until then guys, same time, same place, four o'clock my workshop. I've been Colin Way. Um, see you again. Have a wonderful weekend. Happy turning.